everybody. <laughs> Hello, and welcome. What a wonderful crowd. Uh, you're in for a, a fun afternoon, I'll tell you that. You know, uh, when I was asked to MC uh, a physics slam, I didn't know what it was at first. I've worked for 36 years with the folks from Fermilab on our Tornado and Severe Storm seminar, so many of the same people running the controls here and rolling the tapes and making this whole thing work technically are folks I'd worked with uh, on the uh, Fermilab Tornado programs. And this, like this program today, was an opportunity for scientists to communicate with members of the public. And of course, many of you are in the profession of physics. I'm a meteorologist. I'm Tom Skilling. I am the chief meteorologist at WGN-TV and the Chicago Tribune. So I face one big physics problem every day, and that is what's tomorrow's weather going to look like, you know? I, I deal most of the time, though, with uh, uh, fluid dynamicists and not particle physicists. And today we make a bit of history here uh, with the first uh, Windy City Physics Slam. I'm told the first physics slam took place in Munich perhaps 10 years ago, and it came to this country after that, and Fermilab itself out in Batavia has hosted four such events. But this is the first one in the Windy City. So all of us together are making some, some history here. And what I've discovered in our rehearsals uh, are that we are going to meet a group of incredibly intelligent, incredibly bright people who are in a very human way going to put across the science of physics and particle physics in particular in most unique ways. And I remarked after the rehearsal that I suspect there'll be some recording contracts before this is all over, too, because uh, the presentations are that good. Um, and I'm just dying to have you meet the folks uh, who are going to present today. Um, this is being co-sponsored, by the way, by Fermilab, Argonne Labs, and the University of Chicago, three of the jewels in Chicago's incredible science crown. So to work, I've worked uh, in my broadcast role with scientists from all three of these institutions. And uh, it's a real honor and very humbling to be asked to stand up here and uh, MC this program today. So thank you. And thank you for coming and giving us a chunk of your weekend. Let me explain what's going to happen here today. Um, the rules of the physics slam are this. There are going to be five contestants, uh, each given 10 minutes to make their research as fun and interesting as possible and in very unique ways, as you're going to see. Now, the 10-minute uh, deadline is, uh, is firm. In fact, uh, they're going to hear this obnoxious noise if they run a second over it. Right there. Which makes most of us feel like it's time to run out of the building. There's a fire somewhere that's broken out. But that, that's what I, I can tell you. I bet nobody is going to hear that, uh, that tone, thank goodness. Now, what's going to happen is um, the winner will be determined at the end of this slam by a presentation. We'll bring all the participants out on stage, and your applause will determine who wins uh, the competition. Of course, in my mind, they're all winners because all the presentations are spectacular. But we'll put a VU meter up on the screen. Uh, this is a scientific conference, so we do things very scientifically here. And there'll actually be an, audit, you know, uh, an applause measurement that is uh, being quantified with uh, scientific integrity. So, and I can tell you, Jim Schultz here, who runs the thing, uh, has run my graphics at Fermilab, and we've hit him with almost every imaginable problem you can come, <laughs> you can do in one of these presentations. And Jim never, never messes up. So, at any rate, I with. With that having been said, I wanted to introduce you to our first contestant, who is uh, Renee Logic. Renee comes to us. She's an assistant professor of astrophysics at the Dunlap Institute of the University of Toronto in Canada. She's a TED senior fellow. She's passionate about outreach, as are all of our participants today, and uh, in, in, in engendering uh, public understanding and furthering the public's understanding of science. Uh, she is going to perform what she calls The Death of the Universe, a musical. So here she is, folks. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a subject to sing about, does it? But you'll see that Renee does it very, very well. This is Renee Logic. Good afternoon. Ooh. I take it you can hear me. 
Thank you for coming. I am a cosmologist, which means that I study how the universe started, what it's made of, and ultimately how it's going to end. Lots of people ask me how that relates to my life and how it makes me feel. Uh, so I'm a member of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, which you can see on the screens. And that measures tiny fluctuations in the light from the Big Bang. But when I really think about the universe and its end, I was trying to convey what it would mean to my life and to your life. So I thought, obviously, a little musical cabaret is the way to do it on a Sunday afternoon. And then, uh, about a month ago, I had some additional material added to my life, so I thought, it's perfect. Without further ado, I'll just get going. On a warm summer night, at a friend's wedding, no doubt, I was all dressed up and having fun, when I realized that my love of six years was about to cut and run. I thought, well, isn't that ironic? Kind of like uh, 10,000 spoons. Sorry, I'm I'm at a university in Canada now. That slide is obligatory in every talk I give. I was all crushed and sad, watching SVU on repeat, thinking, should I try and be upbeat about this defeat? Like maybe he would realize his mistaken feat. Why was this rhyme scheme having me beat? And my sad, crying, puffy eyes seemed like sashimi that was good enough to eat. When this thought slipped quietly into my brain. Okay, the words are a downer, I'll admit. But it's hard to not sing when you hear this little refrain. Don't worry, the universe is ending. The heat death is scary, but it's true. Don't worry, the universe is ending. And the heat death, it's coming for the one that left you. We know the universe started hot. It banged, it popped, it cooled a lot. It lumped, it clumped, and made some stars. What wild, amazing cultivars. And all these things, the growth and change, are governed by six numbers small that carry within them such great power, the power to control it all. So. What do you do when your life goes awry, when your messages are just aubergine emoji and hi? <laughs> no, really. When a promising date turns to watching the World Series over your shoulder, when your food gets cold as she talks Illuminati conspiracy theories, oh. when the person that you thought you knew, the one that you gave your heart to, Okay, any biologists in the room, I know that's wrong, but I need it for the song. When they look at you and they go, nah, I think I'd like a fresh start. Well, don't worry, the universe is ending. The heat death is scary, but it's true. Don't worry about your limpid love life, cause the heat death don't care about your boo. What is this strange dark energy that seems to dominate and defy and acts like acting anti-gravity that would make a bull not fall but fly? This lambda term of constant density, it increases with volume, but that's just crazy. We know of nothing else like it, but current alternatives just don't fit. But what we know, we're pretty sure that there's no real backup. The expansion of the universe, yeah, it's speeding up. So soon, okay, not really soon. We're going to meet our end with an empty, heartless, cold goodbye, like the one from your boyfriend. Okay, okay, forget all this romance. Your life is just as bad with your friends and your job. Don't even get me started on my dad. You're trying to work, do the day-to-day -day grind. You're trying to lean in when you have a class to prepare, and woohoo, another grant was declined. 
but there are high fives all round, and your friends seem to flourish and gleam while looking just coyly malnourished. <laughs> Don't worry, the universe is ending. The heat death is shocking, but it's true. Don't worry about those that may upstage you, like everyone that's about to follow me. Cause the heat death is coming for them too. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's been a little rough. Maybe you're quite scared. You still have to go out and live your life and please vote because the heat death isn't as important as the life that we all share. There are bigger fish to fry. N no, really, climate change is going to fry all the fish, so we have to actually figure that out. <laughs> that would be great. So let's just try to keep our spirits high with some really, really stupid songs and some corny jokes. Let's all chill, have a beer, have a beer, keep our spirits high and relax. Or if you really want to, you could have some malort if you have no shame or fear at all. Don't Becoming worry. colder and colder the universe and expanding faster and is faster. Ending. Eventually, the universe the will run out of gas to form scary, stars, and the stars themselves but it's will true. run out of fuel and burn out, leaving Don't the universe worry. with only black holes. Just like Given the heat time, death is coming, these black holes will evaporate, like leaving the heat a universe death. that is completely cold I and bid you now That is what do. we call the heat death. marvelous <laughs> thank you Renee nice job what a beautiful voice she makes the ending of the universe not sound so bad you know they say a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down well the sugar there was was Renee's voice uh, very nice well our next contestant contestant number two is Mario uh, Petit uh, physics PhD candidate at Yale University uh, Mario works uh, on the Mu2E experiment at Fermilab. Uh, she is passionate about the connection between art and science. She earned, interned with uh, arts at CERN in Switzerland and was a member of the Harvard Radcliffe Dramatic Club while earning her degree at Harvard University. She has a lot of helpers here too, as you'll see in a bit. But uh, may I introduce you to uh, Mario uh, Petit. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to try to do this without my notes this time. Um, all right, so hello everyone. My name is Marielle Petit, and I'm here to tell you about the Mu2E experiment at Fermilab. So at the Mu2E experiment, we're searching for a possible clue to explaining the many mysteries of the universe called charged lepton flavor violation. So what does that mean? There are many different types of particles out there. So these are the ones that we call leptons. So you'll notice that they come in three different types, which we call flavors. And the particles in the top row are the electrically charged particles. You might recognize the electron. The particles in the bottom row are the electrically neutral particles, so we call those neutrinos. Now, what's crazy is that recently we've seen that these neutrinos can actually change from one type of flavor to another. But we haven't seen that happen yet for the charged leptons. But we have a hunch that we might be able to catch them in the act. So this might look like the following diagram. Uh, Eric, can you, can you see that okay from here? Um, yeah, but I, can I stop you for a minute? I, uh, I have some comments and a few notes and a microphone. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Um, thank you so much again for coming to listen to me rehearse. I, I just found out this morning what the other folks are doing for the physics slam and the competition is fierce. Well, I guess it better be good. Um, why don't you start by describing this diagram? Sure, so, so this is just a way that particle physicists like to picture a particle interaction. So time typically goes from left to right. And so we start out with some particles on the left and then some interaction happens in the middle and then we end up with our particles on the right. But it's important to say that we can't actually see this happening. So this is just a way of us imagining how it might look like. So it's a little like writing music. Sure, exactly. So it looks complicated, but once you know how to read it, then it can tell you how to read the notes. So it's not the same as music, but it's just a way of writing it down. Um, why don't you tell me a little more about the particles? Sure. So 
i'll just start from the beginning. does that work? yes, i'll stop you. okay, so all right, my name is marielle petit and i'm here to tell you about the mute to e experiment at fermilab. you like cats cats like meow okay, i i don't think i've really heard that before but um i just mean muons so so mute to e is in muons to electrons that that's all i promise it's physics okay um why don't you tell me a little more about muons and electrons okay well what comes to mind when i say muons or electrons well they're particles so i guess i picture tiny dots okay i, I mean like i said we can't actually see what these particles look like but that's not a bad picture to have <laughs> Well, I've heard of electrons. That has something to do with electricity. But uh, right. what about the other one? Right. So, so muons. So muons and electrons are just different types of fundamental particles that have different flavors. Flavors? Like ice cream? Uh, <laughs> well, not exactly. And it is what we actually call them. But as you might imagine, flavors doesn't actually mean that the particles taste any different. It's just a label that we use to distinguish between fundamental particles. And I should also say that, that fundamental particles just means the smallest building blocks of matter. So as far as we know, they're not made up of anything else. And they basically fit together to create everything that we see in the universe. So they're sort of like the smallest Lego sets. I think I can understand that. Good. So, so normally, when a muon decays, it decays to an electron and two neutrinos. Decays, like dies? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> Don't, don't worry, we're, we're not actually hurting any particles here. So when I say decays, we just use it a little bit differently. We just mean we start out with one type of particle and you end up with another. Well, that's a little less sad, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So as I was saying, with the mu to e experiment, typically a muon decays to just an electron and neutrinos. But we're searching for a type of decay that hasn't been seen yet. And according to our current understanding, is incredibly rare. We should basically never see it, which would be a muon changing to just an electron with no neutrinos. Well, I thought you said that never happened. Well, our current understanding of physics says that this would be incredibly rare. So according to our current predictions, this would be about as rare as you becoming president and then shooting nine straight holes in one in a round of golf, and then the White House getting struck by a meteor. <laughs> so it is technically possible, but we can pretty much say that it's so rare that it's never going to happen. But what's fortunate is that we know that the standard model has big holes in it. It doesn't explain things that we see in nature, things like gravity or dark matter. So we know that we need some new theories to possibly extend our current understanding and explain some of these mysteries. And some of these new theories predict that this decay from a muon to an electron might not be as rare as we once thought. So the mu to e experiment is going to be really important in testing whether or not any of these new theories are correct. So if we see this decay, we'll have taken a huge step forward in our understanding of the universe. And if we don't see it, then we can rule out some of these new theories. So either way, it's progress. So I think I understand. You look for the muon decay and you see whether these neutrinos are hanging around afterwards. Well, that's the thing. Neutrinos are actually really hard to see in our detectors. They pretty much just zoom right through without leaving a trace. <laughs> so you don't really know whether the neutrinos are there or not? Uh, no, not exactly. But that's what we're trying to do with the mu e experiment, is set up the conditions so that way we can decide which type of decay actually happened. So it turns out the best way to do this is to start by capturing the muon. Um, capture, like put in jail? Well, no. Uh, when I say capture, I just mean stop it. So, oh. so we, we actually stop the muon with a big clump of aluminum. Aluminum. So I think I get it. The, the muon is like a Pokemon, and the aluminum is like uh, Pokemon Go. <laughs> you know, I, I hadn't thought of it that way before, but it's more like we just send a stream of muons into that aluminum, and then some of them get stuck. All right, so we've stopped the muon. Now, I, I think an equation would actually be really helpful here. Are, are you up for that? Sure, everybody loves equations. Great. <laughs> so this one is E equals MC squared. Einstein, right? You got it. So as you might know, this equation tells us that energy and mass are essentially the same thing, just with a conversion factor of C squared. Now, we also know that energy can't be created or destroyed. So we know that whatever energy we start out with either decay has to be exactly the same at the end of our decay. And luckily, in both of these cases, we start out with the exact same initial energy, which is just the mass of the muon. So I think I get it. If the muon decays to just an electron, you know its energy because it takes all the energy the muon's mass had. Right. 
on the other hand, if it decays to a bunch of things, neutrinos or whatever. right. so so then in that case, the energy has to be distributed between those three particles. so the electron is going to have a much lower energy at the end of the day. so really, that one electron is our crucial clue to tell us what type of decay actually happened, since we can't even see the neutrinos in the first place. so we have to construct a detector that can allow us to measure that electron's energy very precisely. ca so what is this detector? like um some kind of a microscope? ca actually, sort of. so you can picture a big microscope that's ah that's as long as an nba basketball court and tall enough for me to stand in. so we've actually already started constructing this detector. ca so you send in the muons and you wait to see if an electron comes out? ca oh, ah uh, that's really important. i'm sorry. i almost forgot to say it. so if you just send in one muon at a time, it'll be completely hopeless to try to discover something this rare. so we have to send in a bunch of muons at once. how many is a bunch? about 10 billion per second. so by the end of our whole experiment, we'll have sent in one quintillion muons. how many is a quintillion? it's 10 to the 18, so that's one with 18 zeros. well, how in the world do i picture that? <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, i like to think about the number of grains of sand on all of the beaches in the world. that's how many particles we have to send in to get even close to discovering something this rare. well, that's really interesting, and i'm sure when the people finally hear it, they'll really enjoy it. thanks. talking with you has actually made me realize i need to make some big changes to my slides. so thank you. I, well, i do have one last question. can't they do all of this with that huge new accelerator they built in europe? oh, uh, right, the lhc. so so the lhc is really powerful and it's also really big. it's almost 17 miles all the way around. but what's so cool about our experiment is that we can answer some of the same questions that the lhc is asking, but we can see some things that the lhc can't and we do it with a much smaller detector. You don't have to be big to be powerful. <laughs> Thank you, Troop. What a great job. You know, there's a little musical coming to town, Hamilton, and I think we have some some actors ready for that uh, when it comes into town. Thanks very much. That was uh, Mario Petit. Uh, fascinating discussion there. Well, contestant number three, and you're going to love this, is uh, Chris Marshall. Chris is a graduate student at the University of Rochester, and uh, if all goes well, Chris will have his PhD by the end of the coming week. Uh, he studies neutrinos on the Minerva experiment at Fermilab, and he's performing today along with Ben Messerly and Aaron Bercelli uh, under the, his alter ego, MC Truth. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Chris Marshall. MC Truth. Well, they go through him and they go through her. Uh, through her. The whole time changing flavor. Hey. They come and, go. come and go. We don't even know neutrino. Whoa, 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 whoa. They go so fast as they whiz right past. Right past. But not like speed because neutrinos have mass. Hey. They come and go. We don't even know neutrino. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let me tell you all about one of the ways that an unstable nucleus decays. Too many neutrons, and so they emit an electron, a beta ray. But if you look in really close on the decay, you'll see that what really goes on is that a virtual boson turns a neutron into a proton. Betas, you can collect them, direct them, so you can detect them. And then you can look at the spectrum, and something will seem incorrect them. It looks erratic and quite problematic. Shouldn't it be monochromatic? Maybe it's just mathematics. But energy, it should be static. And they go through him and they go through her. Through her. The whole time changing flavor. Hey! They come and go. They come and go. We don't even know neutrino. Whoa, 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 whoa. They go so fast as they whiz right past. Right past. But not like speed because neutrinos have mass. Hey! They come and go. They come and go. We don't even 
no neutrino. Whoa, 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 whoa. People said, well, golly, this spectrum sure does appall me. It sure looks like a folly. Then along came a fella named Polly. He took a look at the datums and said, this is not an eratum. Instead, that Polly did bat them another particle inside the atom. Now, Polly knew that it was small, with almost no mass and with no charge at all. And thankfully, he had the gall to propose a particle that goes through the wall. Now, of course, you and me know just what that particle be, though. Although we cannot see those, we talk about neutrinos that go through him and they go through her. I grew her. The whole time changing flavor. Hey! They come and go. We don't even know neutrinos. Whoa, 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 whoa. They go so fast as they whiz right past. Oh, right. But not like speed because neutrinos have mass. Hey! They come and go. We don't even know neutrinos. Whoa, 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 whoa. Neutrinos, you know there's three of those. Charge is something they lack. And so they don't attract, that's why they have a knack for not making contact. They barely interact, and you know that's a fact. Neutrinos only fade is to just travel straight. Magnets, they don't relate, they barely have a weight. If you don't like your state, then you just have to wait. Cause as they propagate, neutrinos oscillate. And they go through him, and they go through her. Whole time changing flavor. Hey! They come and go. They come and go. We don't even know neutrino. Whoa, 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 whoa. They go so fast as they whiz right past. Right past. But not like speed because neutrinos have mass. Hey! They come and go. They come and go. We don't even know neutrino. Whoa, 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 whoa. Going around the main injector, most intense in town. Call where they make pions and then on through the rock, neutrinos fly on. I come from Fermi Lab, my flavor's mu. I go into the earth, but I go right through. I came into the world from a pion decay, and then I pieced out and I was on my way. I just go straight, no, I don't bend because magnetic fields are not my friends. I'm a neutrino and I'm unique because my interactions are oh so weak. Now this might seem like a boring song because neutrinos just go along. But something interesting is going on. My pure muon flavor's going, going gone. I'm changing type, I'm changing form. If I interact, well, I'ma break the norm. If some machine gets its detect on, I might make a tau or even an electron. Most particles like to stay the same, but I'm a neutrino, I don't play that game. Light speed is C, I can't go that fast because oscillations mean that I have mass. This means that when I go along range, the type of particle I'm gonna make is gonna change as I go along. And the clock ticks, my mass and flavor, they're going to mix in the unlikely event that I interact. My muon flavor won't be intact. You might observe me in a different state cause I'm a neutrino and I oscillate. And I wanna see everybody oscillating with MC Truth. change my flavor how do you know well it all depends on how far i go and also on my energy it's sine squared and delta m squared l over e the chance that i'll be another flavor later depends on the mixing angle theta and how quickly i change flavor as the time passes depends on the difference of the two squared masses some neutrinos are made right here others come from the atmosphere and others from supernova that travel many light years many neutrinos are produced in nuclear fission and travel across the galaxy without a collision across the universe or just across the state all the while i oscillate Good too. It's good for you. I'm not kidding, oscillate.
experiment study when I scatter if I make matter or antimatter. And now it's time for the sequel, where we see if the rates for each are equal. The Big Bang, every particle, there's an antiparticle. And the way neutrinos oscillate might explain how matter came to dominate. And I know you want to know about the mass hierarchy. If it's 3, 2, 1, or maybe it's 2, 1, 3. And we'll see how it goes if CPI violate. All because of the large mixing I will oscillate. Thank you. Notorious Nucleus. Notorious. No, no, no. Notorious. Nucleus. No, no, no. Notorious Nucleus. No, no, no. So you want to study neutrino oscillation to search for leptonic CP violation? Well, it's no vacation. Nuclear effects will be a tribulation. You need to know the energy of the neutrino, and unfortunately, we can't see those. The particles, they make we know how to measure, but it's no free throw, because neutrinos aren't charged electrically, so it's all about what your detector sees, which maybe you expect to be just to charge leptons trajectory. But in neutrino nuclear scattering, we get a lepton and a smattering of hadrons, and the latter thing ends up mattering. It's a little matter thing. And it's called the Notorious Nucleus. No, no, no. Notorious Nucleus. So you want to measure E nu of a new E, but the reconstruction gets a bit screwy when the interaction is in QE. There's a pion that you might not get to see. Energy residuals are wider in a large A nuclear environment. And the firemen, they won't let us build detectors out of hydrogen. We're stuck with iron men. And it's all about the element when intranuclear rescattering is relevant. No matter how intelligent, you'll never find a solution that's elegant. So that big experiment that you on thought it was all about just making muons. Well, it doesn't take too long to realize the importance of the quarks and the gluons in the notorious nucleus. Notorious nucleus. N-U-C-L-E-U-S makes measuring E new a mess. To measure oscillations with any success, there are nuclear effects that we need to address. We've got experiments at high statistics, but nuclear models that are too simplistic. We need something more realistic than a global Fermi gas that's relativistic. Because nucleons aren't so lonely, we have evidence that they're actually homies. homies. Look at the data, you'll say, oh, please, we've got to do better than Smith and Moniz. But we can't just wait for a correction. In experiment and theory, they have a connection to push models in the right direction. We need better data for neutrino cross-sections. It's the notorious nucleus. Notorious nucleus. MC Truth is out. I'll tell you, these particle physicists have all the fun. I, yeah, that's really amazing. What a job and nice recovery, guys, from the beginning. That was uh, Chris Marshall along with uh, Ben Meserly and Aaron Bercelli. Nice job. Well, our next contestant is Clara Nellist, a particle physicist and science communicator working at LOL in Orsay, France. She works on the um, ATLAS experiment at CERN in Switzerland. Passionate about science, communication, and getting more women into physics. She's here with us today. She calls her presentation, Picking Particles from Bubbles to uh, Bosons. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Clara Nellist. Wow. Look at all these people. Hold on. I just need to take a selfie. Everybody say bosons. <laughs> Great, thanks. That's going to be awesome on Instagram. You see, when you want to take a picture of something, nowadays you just hold up your camera or even your phone and press a button. 
The camera works because the light from all around us reflects off different objects like you and me until it makes its way into the camera, is focused by a lens, and then is measured as a digital signal on a sensor. But our eyes um, can only see certain wavelengths of light. There's a whole spectrum either side that we can't measure uh, with our eyes, but that we can measure with equipment. Sometimes that equipment is our skin, especially if you have hair like mine. But indeed, no James Bond spy kit would be complete without an infrared camera to, measure, to see bad guys hiding around the corner. Now, the um, spectrum goes from very short wavelengths, such as gamma rays and X-rays, all the way up to longer wavelengths like microwaves and radio waves. But indeed, what we actually can see with our eyes is tiny compared to what we can't. But with sensitive enough devices, strong enough lenses, and a great location, space, we've been able to see further out into our universe than we have ever seen before. This is the Hubble Deep Field image, and every point of light in this image is a galaxy, which is pretty incredible. Now, so far, I've only been talking about light, and I've only been talking about it as a wave. The particles of light are called photons. Now, uh, waves and particles are the same thing, but since I'm on a time limit, you'll just have to trust me. <laughs> Being able to take a picture of a particle, or even uh, the tracks that it's left behind, is vital in my area of research, high-energy physics. So I'm going to give you a few examples. So now I'm going to talk about neutrinos, and I'd like everybody to give me a big thumbs up, stretched right out in front of you. Thanks. There wasn't really any reason for that. I just needed the approval. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Everybody put your thumbs right back up. Great. Now, every second, there are a billion neutrinos going through your thumbnail. One billion, two billion, three billion. Did anybody feel anything? No? <laughs> That's because neutrinos are extremely light and they're very difficult to detect. So the amount of stuff between your nail and your thumb is really not enough to stop them. There's one way to measure neutrinos, and that's with ice, but we're going to need a lot of it. Being so difficult to detect means neutrinos can travel throughout our universe undeterred by anything that might get in their way until very, very occasionally they might interact with an atom like in our, in our ice. And when this happens, they create an electron, or a heavier, one of its heavier cousins, depending on the type of neutrino that we had. When this happens, the electron starts to move. And if it travels faster than light can travel in the material, in the ice, then it produces something called Cherenkov radiation. This is a cone of light that will travel through the ice and can be measured by an optical sensor. But like I said, we're going to need a lot of ice. So if you're not fortunate enough to be Elsa from Frozen, then uh, we're going to have to go somewhere where there's already a lot of ice and uh, maybe not any polar bears. Um, so how about Antarctica? And this is exactly where the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory was built. And so they just uh, dug some holes in the ice, they dropped some optical sensors in, and hey presto, a giant neutrino camera. Well, yeah, it really wasn't that simple, but again, I'm short of time. But to give you a sense of scale for this detector, you know the Eiffel Tower in France, right? That's where I live. Well, not in the Eiffel Tower. I, I live in a very small apartment that looks out an electrical pylon that if I squint just right, it kind of looks like the Eiffel Tower. Um, but anyway, I think I'm going off point. This is the ice, co ice cube detector. And that tiny little triangle in the bottom right-hand corner is the Eiffel Tower. And so this detector, they put optical sensors within the ice between four and a half and seven and a half Eiffel Towers underneath the ground. That is a pretty massive detector. It's also a pretty cool detector, if you ask me. Anyway, now I'm going to move on to a different type of particle. In fact, a whole set of them. I'm going to talk about antimatter. The antimatter theory was first suggested in a paper by scientist Paul Dirac in 1928. He was trying to combine special relativity, the world of the very fast, with quantum mechanics, the world of the very small, into one single equation. 
Now, he got a very strange result, <laughs> uh, which predicted a whole new set of particles. But he was proven right only five years later when the first antiparticle was discovered. And we're going to take a look at that picture, because to make this measurement, they actually had to take a photograph. Here we see a charged particle traveling through a cloud chamber. So what happens is a trail of water vapor is left behind. Now, uh, the particle track is curved because there's a magnet, and the thick section in the center is a lead plate, which slows the particle down and tells us which direction it was traveling in, in this case, from bottom to top. This particle was found to have the same mass as an electron, but it was bent in the opposite direction, meaning it had an opposite charge. So we, here we have a positive electron, also called a positron, an antiparticle. So the evolution of the cloud chamber experiment was into the bubble chamber experiment, which was bigger and could detect more energetic particles. And here you can see a bubble chamber detector, which is at Fermilab, which is not so far from here, um, but this one is now retired. So now I'm going to whiz up to present day, and I'm going to talk about how you can take a picture of a Higgs boson. Some of you might know this particle by a different name, the God particle. I don't like that name. I'm going to call it the Higgs. So the Higgs is a very heavy particle, and it quickly decays into lighter particles. So how do we take a picture of something if it's already gone? Well, we can predict which lighter particles our heavier particle will change into and how often this happens. So then we build a detector and we measure to see if we're right. These lighter particles that the Higgs changes into, we can think of like a fingerprint for our particle. The detector I use is called the Atlas detector, and it's based at CERN in Switzerland. It's 46 meters long and 25 meters tall, which makes it half the size of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. We are a huge collaboration. There are 5,000 scientists from all over the world working on the Atlas experiment. And you'll see some of them here working in the Atlas control room, taking measurements and uh, checking how the detector is working. Here you can really see the scale of the detector. Protons from the Large Hadron Collider are accelerated and brought to collide in the center of the detector. New particles like the Higgs are created. They change into lighter particles, and they, these move outwards towards the edge of our detector. Atlas is made up of layers, and here you can see the first layers with charged particles being measured. Then we measure the energy, which is the green and the yellow sections, and the final section of the detector measures muons, but you won't see any in this video here. Then the only particle that we have left at the end are neutrinos, but they travel all the way out of our detector without being measured. Remember your thumbnail. So after we have all of this information, the mass, the charge, the energy, and a few extra little details, we have our particle fingerprint. And here we have a Higgs boson turning into two photons, the particles of light that we started with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clara. Very nice. That was uh, Clara Nellist. And last but not least, contestant number five is uh, Dan Hooper. Uh, Dan is assistant professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago and an associate scientist in the theoretical astrophysics group at Fermilab. Uh, his research focuses on the connections between particle physics and cosmology. And I can tell you that his presentation will be very unique as well. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Assistant Professor Dan Hooper. Hi, good afternoon. So I'd like all of you to look around the room and find some object, any object, that you can touch or see or feel or otherwise directly experience. All right, does everyone have one? Uh, yell a few out. A human, a chair, phone. What about something you can't see but you can directly experience? The air. The air. You can feel it with your hand, right? So, okay. We just named a few things. People, chairs, air, etc. What are all of these things made of? Atoms. Okay, so that periodic table of the elements, that thing you learned about in high school chemistry probably, that has a hundred and some objects on it. 
we call these things atoms. They're really just protons, neutrons, and electrons glued together in different combinations. And they make up everything in the universe that we can directly experience. Over the last three or four decades, cosmologists and astronomers have become more and more convinced that atoms aren't the main piece of the matter of our universe. Most of the matter in our universe isn't made up of anything on the periodic table. About five-sixths is made of something else. We don't know what it is. I'm not going to tell you what it is today because we don't know. We'd like to know, but so far we just haven't been able to crack that puzzle. You might ask if we are so sure that it's there, why can't we tell you anything about it? And the reason is that the only way that we can tell it's there is from its gravity. So imagine that for some reason the sun was still there, but you couldn't see it or otherwise directly interacting, interact with it. Would we still know it was there? What does the sun do to the Earth other than heat it? It keeps us in our orbit. Okay? So it, in, its gravity influences the Earth and the other planets, causing them to move in these ellipses around the sun. It turns out dark matter exhibits a lot of gravitational force on the things around it. It's a lot of mass. It, can, it creates a lot of gravity. And things move differently because, it, uh, because of it. Galaxies spin differently, clusters of galaxies spin differently. We can find instances where the dark matter deflects beams of light in ways that can't be explained with ordinary material. Now, if you asked an astronomer three or four decades ago what they thought the dark matter was made of, they might have told you things like some sort of exotic star or planet, maybe a black hole. But we looked for those using these things called microlensing surveys, and they just weren't there, at least not nearly enough to make up all of the dark matter. So today we know that dark matter is something different, something more exotic, something different from any of the particles we've seen in a laboratory or studied at the Large Hadron Collider or anywhere else. And guys like me try to figure out what that might be. Some of us go to deep underground facilities and build ultra-sensitive build ultra detectors trying to de interact, uh, detect the interactions between dark matter and atoms. Others use exotic forms of telescopes like gamma ray telescopes to look for interactions of dark matter in places like the Galactic Center. And then at the Large Hadron Collider and other particle accelerators, we try to manufacture new particles of dark matter, uh, detecting and, and discovering this exotic substance for the first time. Now, so far, we haven't succeeded in any of these endeavors, but that's what we're trying to do. So over the last few minutes, I've given you a lot of information in a very little time, in a very, very short, short amount of time. Um, and as any educator will tell you, you don't really learn anything very well the first time you hear it. You have to hear it multiple times. And I'm also told by educators that you need to hear it in multiple formats. So um, we're going to try a second format now, trying to uh, convey some of the same information in a very different way. So I brought my band, the congregation, along. I'm going to hand the mic off now to Gina Bloom. Hey, guys. How you doing? <laughs> We're going to bring a little bit of soul to science today, so hope you guys enjoy it. that we 
know is that it's not made of atoms. of dark matter that surrounds you and me. To have so many bright people so talented in the performing arts, it's just, it's amazing. Well, this has been quite a program, and now you, the audience, get a chance to decide who the winners are. And, of course, they're all winners, but uh, we're going to take a round of applause as we bring our participants up on the stage. And you'll see a meter uh, up on the screens, uh, which gauge the intensity of the the uh, applause, and this will be the basis, the criteria for which, by which we uh, d determine the winners. So if I could welcome back each of our performers, all of them, all at once, and what we'll do is we'll go down the row, they will line up in the order they've appeared here on the stage, and then we'll take a round of applause, and we'll see what happens from there. Come on up, everybody. <laughs> I can't help but think Einstein has got to be rolling over in his grave, you know. I just maybe he got up out of it, actually, you know, at this point. <laughs> All right. All right, come on over, guys. <laughs> you are a talented group of people, I'll tell you, and also very, very brave <laughs> to get up here uh, and, and put on these uh, magnificent performances. All right, ladies and gentlemen, applause now uh, for our first contestant, Renee Logic, professor of astrophysics. <laughs> Renee, you're the next. You're the next Adele, you know, it just, uh, you, are, you are fantastic. Number two, contestant number two, Mario uh, Petit. Mario. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> and you had a lot of assistance, Mario, a good group. Very nice. Number three, contestant number three, Chris Marshall. Chris.
Very nice. And contestant number four, Clara Nellist. Clara. <laughs> And finally, contestant number five, Dan Hooper. <laughs> and, and might I add, we should applaud all of you. What a terrific audience. I mean, uh, you've been amazing. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It's so wonderful to have all of you here. Well, uh, you are quite a group, and thank you. This has been fun. I now know what a physics slam is, and we all do. So this is, this is a lot of fun. You're very brave uh, for getting up here, but you're also talented, my word. You could do a Broadway show. <laughs> all right, here it is. The results are in. All right. Gotcha. All right. So this is, um, let's see. We'll start with number five. Gotcha, okay. We'll work our way up to number one. Very good, all right. All right, now here is uh, what the judges have come in with based on the applause. Uh, number five, uh, we want to thank Renee uh, uh, Losick for the uh, beautiful job. <laughs> Renee Logic, Logic, Renee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Number four. Now, am I right on this? Uh, th this is right here. <laughs> yes, that's number four. All right. Dan Hooper of the University of Chicago. Dan. <laughs> Dan, thank you, Mario. What a job. Go ahead. By the way, uh, Dan's band is going to be performing the congregation uh, at the end of the program here. So we have some more entertainment to come. Number three, Clara Nellis of CERN. Clara. <laughs> Clara Nellis. Yeah, Thank you very much, Clara. Thank you. And uh, number two, Chris Marshall of the uh, University of Rochester. Chris. See, I think I did the wrong one. You know what? All right, I'll give you a good job, Jenny. A nice recovery on that. Uh, and finally, this is right here, right? All right, Jim. All right. Yes. Yes. All right. Thanks, Jim. From Yale. Uh, Mario Petit, number one. <laughs> and Liana, this is Liana. <laughs> and the other young people, too. <laughs> Where's the troop over there? <clears throat> you know, I thought the young people involved, Mariel, uh, in your show uh, were just here to see us, and I didn't realize they were participants. And I said to them, uh, how nice to have you here. What time did you get up coming in? They came in from the western suburbs. I guess Oswego and Yorkville, am I right? And Lombard. Sorry about that. And uh, you said you got on the train at 6 o'clock this morning. I know. So you're going to sleep tonight. I'll tell you, you all did a wonderful job, and so did all of our participants. Thank you, everybody. Uh, what a great job. <laughs> all right. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Now, what we're going to do, folks, stay here on the stage. Because what we're going to do is we're going to open up our uh, participants here to your questions. Uh, and uh, believe me, uh, we're going to have microphones positioned anywhere and everywhere, we hope. So wait for a microphone to get close to you. And you may address the question to uh, single participants or to anybody up here on the, the uh, any one of our participants here on the stage. Uh, and there ought to be a lot of good questions about particle physics and, and the work that's been being done by these amazing scientists. 
um, let me see here. Do we have a question? And don't be afraid. Oh, yes, here's one right here from this gentleman. I, let's see if we've got a microphone over close to you. Thank you. Hey, great oh, job. there we go. All right, we'll run a microphone. Oh, you've got one. Good. Go right ahead. So here's, here's my question. Woo. Um, is there any dark matter in our solar system? Yeah, as far as we can tell, the dark matter is pretty uniformly distributed in our sort of neighborhood of the Milky Way. Uh, that means that if, for example, if we imagine the dark matter particles come in certain pieces, uh, maybe 100 times heavier than a proton, there's something like one of these in every coffee cup at wow. any given time. And they're moving fast, so they're moving through us many, many, many times a second. So we're in a sea of dark matter constantly passing through our body, but it doesn't interact with our body, so we don't directly experience that. Thank you, Dan. By the way, folks, feel free to take in the exhibits in the back, and also you may go online and uh, check out uh, hashtag Felix, uh, Physics Slam, all one word, lowercase, Physics Slam, uh, hashtag ahead of it, and uh, you get more information on today's program. Another question. This is a question to everybody out there. Yes. Um, how likely is it that, w that uh, something from science fiction days will happen? That is time travel. So we are already traveling through time. <laughs> Come on! Very nice. Uh, I know that wasn't the answer that you wanted. Um, the, the, the difficulty with that is that there are lots of equations which govern uh, how we can move through time because of how uh, information is transferred in the universe. Um, and Einstein's theory of general relativity describes you know, ways we can, we can move through time, but it gets kind of tricky. So I wouldn't buy your ticket to the past just yet. <laughs> Very good. Another question, folks. Yes, I uh, please formulate uh, your uh, view on parallel universe and uh, quantum computing. Uh, okay, so the, if you take an a undergraduate course in quantum mechanics, they teach you this thing called the Schrodinger equation. And what the Schrodinger equation does is it takes this thing called the wave function, which describes the probability of finding a particle in any given place at a given time, and it evolves it with time. It shows, it shows what the solutions can look like and, and how they change with time. The conventional way that this equation is interpreted in these classes is that whenever you measure that particle, it goes from having this big spread out wave function existing in multiple places at one time to existing in the place you measure it in. So it, it collapses the wave function down to a point. Um, a more radical interpretation of the same equation that works just as well, not better, not worse, just as well, is, uh, is, is, was proposed in the 50s by this guy named Hugh Everett. And he said, well, maybe the wave function never collapses. Maybe the electron was in a bunch of places, and then we observe it, and then there are a bunch of us observing electrons in different places. So the smeared out quantum fuzziness of the universe propagates through everything, including through us. That could very well be the right answer. We just can't tell. And there's no experiment we can even hypothetically do to find out. Huh. Interesting, Dan. OK. Um, wait, is antimatter matter that goes backwards in time? <laughs> All right. Okay, so when we, we saw in a couple of the presentations these things called Feynman diagrams. Uh, we saw a particularly complicated one in, in, in yours. Um, and and these, depiction, these, these describe different kinds of ways that particles can interact among each other. The question you're referring to is, is that if you draw an arrow of, say, an electron pointing from the left to the right, we call that thing an electron. If we draw the same thing but drawing from the right to the left, we call it an electron going backwards in time. But that same symbol of an electron going backwards in time is a positron or an antimatter version of electron moving forward in time. We can entirely switch out those symbols and mean the same thing. So in some sense, you can think of an electron 
and a positron is the same thing moving in different directions in time. Now that doesn't mean that I can send positrons backwards in time and, and send messages into the past or time travel or have make sure my grandfather is murdered before he meets my grandmother and therefore I don't exist and therefore I don't send the message back and you see the problem. Um, but it does mean that in some sense an electron going forward in time is the same thing as a positron going backwards in time. I have one more. Wait, is it possible that dark matter is made of neutrinos since, wait, since dark matter is really hard to detect uh, and, and neutrinos are hard to detect, but since neutrinos do have mass, they interact with gravity? Is the question whether neutrinos could be dark matter? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, do you want to? Yeah, so there was a time when it was thought that that might be the case, but then we measured the mass of the neutrino, and the neutrinos are too light. They have too little mass to explain the rotations of, of the galaxies and the, the ways that we observe the consequences of dark matter. So we know now that while neutrinos have a lot of the properties that we would like our dark matter to have and that they don't interact very often, they're electrically neutral, uh, neutrinos just don't weigh enough to be dark matter. There must be something else. Jim, I see a young lady over here, a couple of young ladies here. Yes. All oh, right. This is strictly a very personal question for each of you. Um, I teach little kids and I want them to be inspired to what they want to do for their lives. What was the event that inspired you and how old were you when you knew that you couldn't get enough of this and you wanted to do this for the rest of your life? Uh, my early memories are um, being taken outside when there was a meteor shower or uh, a lunar eclipse or anything to do with space. My parents were really enthusiastic. Um, so I just loved seeing all of those things. And when I was very little, I read a book by Carl Sagan um, called Contact. And the main character in that is a scientist. And I just thought she was really cool. Um, and I wanted to, to be more like her and I wanted to learn more about science. Um, so that's the, the very early memories I have of how, how I got into this. Yeah, and I just felt like adding that I feel like probably all of us can tell a story like that of, of going outside and being inspired by stars or even seeing an amazing show. But one of my favorite parts of this job is that I continue to have moments like that. You know, you continue to be so, so surprised by the discoveries that we're making and the machines that we can build. So certainly I think I can cite a moment or two, but really I find them all the time. So I, I hope that your students are just as lucky, and I'm sure they are. Do you know, I, I talked to the, the two young ladies you've just heard from, too, the two young researchers, and, and each of them indicated they were interested in possibly becoming astronauts, uh, which I thought was, was quite interesting. Is that something? Yeah. Good luck to you. Thank you. <laughs> it's all right. Huh. All right. Oh, this gentleman here. Yes. Yeah, I like to know where uh, or what the current thinking is on the possibility of uh, particles uh, tra traveling faster than the speed of light. Uh, you know, the, the theory of relativity says the speed of light is constant, but I've heard or read that there are certain circumstances where, you know, so I'm curious as to your uh, thoughts or current uh, thinking on uh, sure. I, so a quick summary of that is um, I think a lot of us were really interested in, in that coming into the news a couple years ago. Um, as far as we know, Einstein's theory of special relativity is completely intact. Um, so I can assure you that, that particles that, that have mass, as far as we know, aren't traveling faster than the speed of light. So, so that was a report that was given earlier um, that was later found uh, to have had some technical issues which caused those those readings. So as far as we know, that doesn't happen. But um, who knows? We don't like to say ne we don't like to say never in physics. But that that's pretty rigorous as far as we know. Go ahead. Can I just add? So sometimes um, when one is chatting with people, they say, "Oh, you scientists just assume that say the speed of light doesn't change, or you assume that um, Einstein's theory is correct, and so you're biased and you're blinded." But one of the things that we do as scientists is we're actually always testing these models and these assumptions. So in cosmology, for example, instead of just assuming the speed of light is constant, we look for 
can we detect a change with time, with cosmic time, in the speed of light? And so far, we've come up with things looking normal. But it's not just because we assume it to be so. So keep asking those questions. Excellent answers. Yes, in the back. Hi. Um, question I have relates to the amount of dark matter in the universe. So I know I've, it seems that dark matter has come out in my lifetime, at least, or the idea of it. Um, and now, in some of the presentations, it looked like we think a, more than a majority of the universe is made up of dark matter. Is that um, from the idea that it, dark matter used to be a counterpart to matter? Does it create a dilemma that now we're finding more and more dark matter than matter equivalent? Yeah, so there's really no reason to think that the amount of atoms in the universe should balance against the dark matter. They can be totally different things. It would be like finding out that there were the same number of cats as dogs. I guess there could be, but easily there could be more than one than the other. So in this case, it turns out there's more dark matter than, than, than uh, my trumpet player confused me earlier by getting me to talk about antimatter. There's more dark matter than atoms in the universe, but, but it could have been the other way around or anything else. And we really only learned that fairly recently. Um, if you go back to the 70s, people were still arguing about whether there was any dark matter. By the 80s, they were pretty sure there was some. And by the 90s, they knew it outweighed the amount of atoms. They didn't know by how much. Um, around 2000-ish, with uh, the improvement in these experiments, we really began to pinpoint the amount of dark matter. Now we have a very precise measurement of just how much dark matter there is in the universe. Huh. But one thing that we are concerned about is how much uh, matter and antimatter there is. Um, because uh, from everything we know, we assume that at the beginning of the universe, matter and antimatter uh, were equal. And so when matter and antimatter come into contact with each other, they annihilate and turn into photons. So why isn't our universe just completely made of light and not, uh, doesn't have any of this stuff in? So something is slightly different between matter and antimatter that meant that most of the matter and antimatter annihilated and it's just everything else that's left around in this universe was just that tiny, tiny fraction that was left over. And, but I mean, it's really good for us that it was. <laughs> yeah. So one final thing to add to the question. Um, so my, other than heartbreak, my song was about the death of the universe, but that's driven by something called dark energy which is very different from dark matter. Um, the only similarity is that they have the word dark in their names. But dark energy is what we think is dominating the energy of the universe. And that's particularly strange because it, we know it isn't a particle. We know it isn't uh, like anything else, uh, like some invisible uh, matter that acts gravitationally. It really has properties that act opposite to the way we expect gravity to behave. And the fact that that Dark energy dominates the energy of the universe. Yes, that is very scary, but I'm working on it. So. <laughs> right here. I see some questions up here too, folks. Okay. With the mic. Uh, my question is about the mass of neutrino. Uh, does Higgs mechanism that explain the origin of mass can be used to explain the mass of neutrino? Uh, so the. Just so I understand what your question is, you're asking if the Higgs mechanism explains the mass of the neutrino. And the answer is maybe. Um, <laughs> if it does, then it, there's another thing that's kind of weird, which is why, if it's the same mechanism, is the neutrino so tiny and the other particles are, are compared to the neutrino are so heavy. So there's another possibility, which is that the mass of the neutrino comes from some other mechanism and uh, we don't know which one it is. And there are experiments that are underway right now yeah. looking for something called neutrinoless double beta decay that might tell us. Excellent. Yes, my question is on the, new, on the neutrino also. The, um, the detector that's a water chamber underground that it captures the neutrinos in a flash of light, if the neutrino has no charge, how does, how, where does the flash of light come from? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the neutrino itself goes right through the detector and it does not emit any light whatsoever. The way that we know that a neutrino interacted in the detector, it bumped into a, probably an oxygen nucleus in the water 
And when that interaction occurs, the products of the interaction have charge. And it is those particles that we can detect by looking at the light inside the detector. And then we can infer that the particle that created that mess was a neutrino. So basically, if you look at it, it looks like there is just a bunch of charged particles originating out of nowhere uh, in the middle of your detector. And that's how we know that a neutrino came in and, and bumped into an oxygen nucleus. Yeah, something, something happens that we couldn't see the original thing, but you see the effect of it. Yeah, and a lot of these detectors are very deep underground because we want to shield them from the other particles like coming from our atmosphere and, and around us all the time so that we know that the only thing that could have got that, that deep was a neutrino. We have a question here? Yeah, this is uh, to, to each of you, I guess. Um, since uh, you have all, this is being sponsored by Argonne National Lab and Fermilab, and we can emphasize the word lab, how do you feel about the fact that all the um, publicity and the hype in physics today is uh, centered on um, the theories of quantum gravity, which apparently are testable, and interpretations of quantum mechanics, which are sort of metaphysical arguments to um, that they, they basically have taken over um, both at universities and in uh, the popular science publications um, the attention of the public. So one of the cool things about um, bringing theory and experiment together, that's one of the things that I do as an observational cosmologist. I care a lot about data and I care a lot about theories. And actually, um, a lot of theories that maybe uh, difficult to compute or have statistics in them, like quantum mechanics, they actually are testable. So for example, I put out a paper last week where we're testing for a type of particle called the axion that would come from string theory. So string theory is something that is a um, speculative theory, but it makes some predictions for this particle. And what we showed in our paper is that in 10 to 15 years, we will be able to either detect or rule out this particle completely. So actually what we spend time doing as scientists is trying to prove ourselves wrong, trying to rule out theories, because if we can rule them out, then we can move on to other things. So quantum mechanics and um, some other different mathematical theories actually are the bedrock of how we make these observations. Move on here. Uh, thank you guys for your presentations. They were all really entertaining and, and informative. Um, a lot of your research uh, seems to be data-driven. Um, with kind of advents and improvements in machine learning and kind of modern kind of statistical techniques, how much do you find that that impacts the current work that you do? And do you see it um, having a bigger um, uh, role in, uh, in the future research? One interesting uh, example to give is that I work at CERN, and um, there to communicate, physicists linked computers together, uh, and this was the invention of the World Wide Web. Um, so being able to share data and to communicate quickly uh, can then have an impact on the, the wider world. Um, but the amount of data that we create at CERN is, is huge um, and we do something called uh, cloud computing so I can write a piece of software to analyze um, some data from the experiment and then I send it off uh, to the cloud and it gets sent to computers in America or in China in Japan uh, whichever computer is free and then it can process that huge amounts of data and send it back to me quickly which means that um, you know we don't have to wait a long time to be able to test this Ladies and gentlemen, one more question, if that's all right. Yes, this young man here. Um, if the Higgs boson exists, do gravitons exist? Because um, when I think of the fundamental forces, each one has its own exchange particle, but we only know of three. Um, but, you know. So, so that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure if you heard the news that came out recently. So CERN, um, we, we measure a lot of data and there was a, a 
a statistical flux, but for a while it looked like something might be a appearing. Um, and many theorists came up with suggestions what it could be, and Graviton was one of those suggestions. Now, this has gone away, and that's not unusual. It was just um, because we collect a lot of data, you know, our statistics goes up and down. But it is something that people are very excited about, that we're trying to look for, and maybe if you become a physicist, you could be the one to do it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I wonder if we don't have a young physicist in the making here, do you think? I look forward <laughs> that, to seeing that you. That must be really gratifying. It must be gratifying to get answer, uh, questions from young people like this. I mean, I know you all are dedicated to spreading the word on science, and, and what a marvelous Q&A period you've given us. Thank you so much. We've learned so much, and your performances were outstanding. <laughs> And audience, thank you so much for coming. I, you know, our Sundays are so valuable, and for so many of you to take time to come, and I know some of you are at the conference here, which is marvelous, but thank you so much for joining us today and giving us a, a chunk of your Sunday afternoon. Hope we do this again. See you later, everybody. And we'll hear the band Concussion. This is Dan Hooper's band as, uh, as we depart today. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>